Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started if that sounds good. So welcome everybody again. My name is Chrissy Gargano. I work at the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance National Office, and I will be your moderator today for um, this session that we have right now, the um, Mental Health Equity, Access and Outcome Disparities in Black Communities with Dr. Alpha Stewart. So if this is your first session at the DBSA Leadership Summit, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, thank you for joining us. During the session at any time, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A box. We have disabled the chat for now. So if you have anything um, you'd like to ask, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of um, Dr. Stewart's presentation. And at the conclusion of our set of our session and during any downtime you have, if you're attending other Leadership Summit sessions, we invite you to join us at the Leadership Summit Lounge where you can take part in meditative exercises or, or learn more about um, any of DBSA's many resources, including our wellness toolbox, our support groups, our parents and caregivers community, our advocacy work and our peer support specialist program and more. So with all of that said, I think we're going to just go ahead and get started. And I'm going to introduce all of you to our esteemed presenter for today, Dr. Alpha Stewart. Dr. Stewart is Senior Associate Dean for Community Health Engagement and Associate Professor in Psychiatry at University of Tennessee Health Science Center. She also serves as Chief of the Division of Social and Community Psychiatry and Director of the Center for Health and Justice Involved Youth in the Department of Psychiatry, where she manages community-based programs serving children impacted by trauma and mental health conditions and their families. She previously served as Executive Director for Memphis's federally funded System of Care Program for Children with Serious Emotional Disorders and their families. And Dr. Stewart is former Executive Director of the Detroit Wayne County Community Health Agency one of the largest public mental health systems in the US. Dr. Stewart also served as De Deputy Commissioner and later as Interim Commissioner of the former New York City Department of Mental Health and as CEO in other large public health and mental health systems in New York and Pennsylvania, where she oversaw the management and development of programs for persons with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, and justice system involvement. Dr. Stewart received her medical degree from Temple University Medical School and her psychiatric residency at what is now Drexel University. In 2017, Dr. Stewart was elected as the 145th president of the American Psychiatric Association, the first African-American ever elected to this position in the entire 175 year history of the organization. And she is also past president of the Black Psychiatrists of America the Association of Women Psychiatrists and the American Psychiatric Foundation. She has received numerous awards and honors, including honorary degrees, visiting professorships and honorary membership in the South African Society of Psychiatrists. And last but not least, Dr. Stewart serves on the board of directors here at the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. We're so honored to have her here um, working with us and we can't wait for you all to hear from her. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it along to Dr. Stewart. Well, thank you, thank you, Chrissy. That was a, a long uh, introduction and I'm always reminded that I'm getting older when I hear some of the jobs I've had because I remember having them and what years those were. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm truly honored to, be, to have been asked to uh, speak today. I am a proud member of the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance and um, having recently joined the board, I'm excited that this may be kind of my coming out party as a representative uh, on that board. Uh, I know that many of my friends and certainly colleagues from DBSA are in the uh, audience today. So I'm looking forward to sharing information and, <clears throat> excuse me, and perhaps having a dialogue about some of the things uh, that we need to talk about <clears throat> excuse me, when we talk about mental health equity and disparities in mental health in um, um, BIPOC, um, particularly in Black communities. Um, you know, this is the title uh, for the topic I was asked to speak to today, 
And in the time allotted, I'm going to cram a lot into this particular topic. Uh, so uh, these slides are available and you don't have to worry about trying to capture everything in notes. I, I really enjoy doing these presentations because it gives me a chance to have a dialogue with people. And uh, while initially it'll be me talking, I hope if I can keep to my time that we can have some time to have some dialogue about this very important issue. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've, I've had quite a, an interesting career that has included various components of the equity and health disparity um, issue. Um, the mental health equity uh, paradigm and, and how we are using achieving equity to reduce health and mental health disparities, I think is very timely. I think it's very challenging as a topic for discussion. And I think it is essential for the overall health and well being of all of us going into uh, the future. Certainly, we have come through a year and a half of very challenging uh, times emotionally, psychologically, uh, financially, and other ways. And, and I think it's, it's fitting that here at this summit where we're talking about leadership and particularly leadership in the area of mental health, I think it's particularly important that we spend this time talking a little about equity. So um, to start, uh, if I can get my slides moving. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, to start, uh, normally when I do these, I'm doing something for continuing medical education or continuing education. And I have a whole series of disclosures and disclaimers and uh, other things. For this particular topic, I, I chose to stick with a disclaimer because I think setting the stage and framing a context is very important in how we approach these kinds of conversations. The acknowledgement that it is difficult and sometimes very uncomfortable as a topic, that there are complex and complicated feelings that often emerge as we get into the discussion, and that for some people who, who may be participating, what they will hear may sound like an accusation of racism or other uh, isms, and it's really not, but, but I feel the obligation to acknowledge upfront that that may happen and to encourage people uh, to capture those feelings and to, to be prepared to talk about them, if not today, in other settings to kind of process them. And the fact that when, when these topics are discussed, and I learned this from a good friend of mine, Dr. Ruth Shin, who frequently lectures on this, that, that many in the audience feel like when these topics are on the agenda, that it's for a very specific reason, reason which is accusatory and blaming and shaming, and that there is very little objectivity on the part of the speaker when they are talking about this. And again, all I can say is that that is not the case, uh, but I can't convince people uh, that that is not what they are feeling. Uh, I encourage people to consider allowing this to be for the next 40 minutes or so, a kind of gracious space where whatever we hear, whatever we wind up talking about is not taken personally, that we see it in its broader context. And, and this picture for me is kind of a centering uh, object, um, because I, I love Jacob Lawrence for, for one thing, and, and his work always makes me feel less stressed, but also I think because the symbolism behind learning and education and an adult and a child, and where we pick up on many of these things that later cause us such angst around race and racism and discrimination and all of those things, that we really do need to have a context where gracious space is what we allow. And then finally, the starting point for me is always the perspective of the individual about whom I am speaking. And in this case, today, we're talking about people uh, in the Black community, Black people, African Americans. And I am, I am drawn to James Baldwin for many reasons. Uh, most of you could probably understand. But this quote resonates with me in a way that I think is a, is a good way to begin the conversation 
of what we are dealing with. To be a Negro, and, and contextually, this was the 60s, so Negro is an appropriate um, connotation. To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. And so when people say to me, why is everybody so angry? I didn't do it. I'm not responsible. Uh, you can't blame me. You know, mental health has its own history of, of uh, concerns and questions and and challenges when it comes to race. Uh, and, and so I think Baldwin in this one uh, quote begins to engage me at least in why I think this is so important. Um, health and mental health equity includes opportunity for everyone to have good mental health. And I want you to remember the word opportunity as we go through this because equity is really all about opportunity. It is the, the potential for everyone to have a chance to have what they need at the time that they need it in the way that they need it. That's true for health and mental health. It's true for financial uh, wealth and, and stability. It's, it's true for every aspect of our life and particularly for those things that we now uh, capture in the phrase social determinants of health and mental health. It's the opportunity that comes with equity that we must focus on uh, during, during discussions like this. And, and we know that inequity begins the cycle that results in disparity. And while there, there may be only a slight difference in mental illness prevalence across racial groups, uh, if you are a member of one of those uh, racial and ethnic minority groups, as you can see, you're less likely to have access to health. And I include mental health every time I say health, because there is really no health without mental health. Um, so you're less likely to have access to health care. You often receive poor or uh, less culturally competent health care. You often seek out alternative forms of care that are culturally based and appropriate as far as you understand for people who are like you, people in your family, people in your community, people in your racial group. Um, there are barriers to treatment seeking uh, based on culture, race, and ethnicity that resonate around those things like stigma and mistrust and discrimination. Sometimes you just can't afford treatment services. You don't have access to the um, uh, insurance coverage or other aspects of payment that many are afforded. Uh, and, and based on race and zip code and other things, you just can't afford to get the services. Uh, we, we know that the science is very clear that racial and ethnic minority groups are underrepresented when it comes to research. And so the things that we consider to be cutting edge treatment often have not been tested on individuals outside of predominantly white male populations who tend to be the largest groups in, in the research cohort. And then for many, <clears throat> we've known for decades that for people of color, and particularly for Black people and uh, Latinx folks, we enter treatment later and have worse outcomes. A lot of the times because of the discrimination, the lack of access, and the inability of the treatment system to understand our help-seeking behaviors and how to help us understand how they're trying to help us because of a lack of cultural competence. So these are just some of the things. I'm sure you've all seen this, this dialogue, uh, this uh, diagram. Uh, the, one of the original ones was the three boys looking at a ball game and uh, trying to understand uh, how each of them, a short guy, and, and they were all on a box. Uh, it, it was upgraded to the bicycles to talk about and include differing abilities uh, as part of the equity equality equation. Uh, there's a, another one that talks about that shows uh, girls looking at a fruit tree and how each of the equality, equity, justice uh, all have a component that must be taken into account. And I share this only because I think it helps remind us that not everybody can be helped with this from the same standpoint, using the same structure and strategy or treatment modality. And it really does have to be adjusted and customized to meet the needs of individuals, not a one size fits all uh, kind of a, um, a resolution to this problem. 
So there are about a hundred definitions of health inequity. You know, if you just look at them on the internet in a search engine, you can find at least a hundred. This one I like because of the words that I've highlighted. We're talking not about individual issues, but systematic and systemic issues. These are unavoidable. Inequities are avoidable. I'm sorry, avoidable, not unavoidable. They are unjust. And that means that we can take an action to correct them. And whether we're talking about health or housing or transportation access or the other things that create barriers for people getting help in the mental health arena, these are avoidable, unjust, and actionable issues that are part of a systematic challenge that we face and that can't be addressed individually without looking at the culture in the system and the barriers and challenges that come with that system. Um, these, these inequities arise because populations, certain ones at least, are made vulnerable to illness or disease, often through the inequitable distribution of the protections and supports that would allow them to have the opportunity to avoid these things that would create a more just system for them to participate in these things. Uh, and so that opportunity keeps coming up when we're talking about uh, inequities. This is just another graphic illustration where in the center we're talking about creating healthier, more equitable communities where individuals and families can live, work, learn, and play in an environment that is surrounded by an equitable system. Uh, and all of those things in the social determinant of health ring that surrounds that core and then all of the community driven solutions, because the reality is folks, uh, long before people like me entered into community engagement and community support and community outreach, communities managed to keep things together. It may not have been to the, to the standard that I might set, but people existed in as safe an environment as they could create. They figured out ways to take care of each other and themselves. And they kept striving for more and better, because as we all know, when we know more, we do better. Um, and then the, the inequities that surround this, that sort of bind all of this, are those barriers that we really have to work on breaking if we're going to have uh, health equity instead of inequity and disparity. Now, some of the determinants of health that we thought about before 1999 are captured in this pie chart. Um, just under half of them, we related to those social and economic factors that we would now describe as social determinants of health. Uh, over 50% really reflected what we knew about the science and what our research told us about those things that happen um, when, when, when we're in a certain physical environment, when we have access or not access to certain clinical care, uh, when our health behaviors, those risky things that we do, everything from smoking and drinking and, and using drugs and promiscuity and risky behaviors, all of those things were part of that determinant of health before 1999. What we began to understand around uh, the uh, Healthy People 2020 initiative and drive um, was that there were drivers and determinants that we could identify. We have come to now talk about them as social determinants of health and mental health, but they are essentially the things, those six things that are on there with a few more. And I would draw your attention to the final circle where it's trust. And that has become, since we began talking more in the language of health equity, and reducing and eliminating health disparities and uh, achieving health equity and social determinants of health and all of our more recent public health discussions, all of those things boil down to, do the communities we want to support and serve trust us as a system? And by and large, I think uh, many of us in the community health and public health arena say we've got some work to do to be trustworthy in these communities. And we, in the Black community, we can relate that back to 
uh, the Tuskegee experiment, but it really has a history that goes back, back much further than that. And I won't, I won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but, but I think captured in this particular quote by Paula Braveman is the, is the essence of what the work is that we have to do. Incorporating into health equity that aspect of social justice in health. Again, opportunity that no one is denied the possibility to be healthy for belong because they belong to a group that has historically been economically and socially disadvantaged. It is essential that we understand if we know nothing else about the work ahead of us, it is essential that we, we reconcile the fact that there is an aspect of social justice that must be incorporated into health because that's how we bring in opportunity. That's how we bring in the possibility for people to be healthy, including mentally healthy, uh, as opposed to lacking in that because they belong to a certain group that has been historically disenfranchised socially, legally from the justice standpoint, but also from the healthcare support and service uh, standpoint. It is essential that we understand that. And we don't have to just take it on faith that we should believe this because there is a whole science that underpins it that makes it very clear whether it's health, or mental health or the combined aspects that, that we must take into account for both of them, we have a large body of science. This is just starting with 19, in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, when specifically our Surgeon General at the time, the 16th Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher, produced the first ever report on mental health out of the Surgeon General's office. 1999 was the first time we paid attention to the importance of mental health as part of the overall health standard that we should all live by. Uh, a year or so later, he produced a second report specific to mental health as it relates to culture, race, and ethnicity. And if you've not looked at this, it serves as a wonderful foundation for understanding what we need to do, why we need to do it, and begin starting us down the path and, and creating the blueprint for what it is we need to do to eliminate the disparities in health for many racial and ethnic minorities, as well as creating an environment where health equity is the solution to one of the problems that we face with respect to mental health and people of color. These are, these are just the starting building blocks. Since then, there have been a host of other people who have added to the body of understanding around this, who have, who have gone further with the science and the research as to the reality of why this is important. And, and again, my colleague, Dr. Shem and Dr. Uh, Compton uh, produced this book on the social determinants of mental health specific to each of those six drivers on that previous slide, including the mistrust in communities of color around appreciating and accepting uh, in, in, a, in an appropriate way, uh, the kinds of things that the mental health system specifically ought to be offering them and, and creating a framework for how we can do better because we know better. Um, certainly, uh, during today, uh, any talk about health inequity today has to be inclusive of a conversation about the impact of COVID-19. And we all know the, the data. Uh, COVID-19 came in uh, 18, 20 months ago, and it has devastated uh, communities around the world. And here in the United States, we are still calculating the psychological toll that it is taking on the population. We know that more people are reporting having distress psychologically due to parts of what's going on with COVID, everything from the uncertainty and anxiety that appeared at the beginning of the pandemic to the economic upturn and, and downturn um, when, when the shutdowns and lockdowns began. Uh, the, the accompanying pandemic-related issues, the economic and employment and housing stability issues, and then layered on top of that, 
the racial psychological distress associated with the recognized disparities in COVID, again, for racial and ethnic minorities, and layered on top of that, the racial and social injustice that accompanied the pandemic, which because we were all in lockdown, we couldn't avoid seeing and knowing and hearing and the cries of, I didn't know it was that bad. Uh, which have contributed to the psychological distress. And now that we're in a period in many communities of re-entering the workplace, re-entering uh, life in a community as opposed to in lockdown, these impacts psychologically are continuing to grow. And it didn't matter if you lived alone, if you were part of a family unit, if you lived in a multi-generational, uh, your age, your sex, your race, there were, there were psychological issues that you began to have to deal with um, that, that certainly have manifested over the last few months. And now as in, in many communities, kids are returning to school, young adults are returning to college, uh, people are going back to work. We're beginning to see even more of that negative impact psychologically on many of us due to COVID-19. Um, the APA uh, took, did a poll and, and, you know, in the early part of this year, 1,000 adults, 18 and older, and discovered something that I'm sure is no surprise to anyone on the line, that we've got some challenges ahead of us thanks to this pandemic. Uh, people are very concerned about their own emotional health and well-being uh, based on their experience through the the pandemic, the numbers don't lie. Uh, and for people who have children under 18 in their homes, uh, they're very concerned about the mental state of their children uh, and, and believe and, and report that the pandemic has caused a lot of mental health problems for their children, with at least a quarter of them uh, saying that they've had to try to seek mental health uh, support from professionals, and uh, almost a quarter saying that they've had difficulty doing that. Uh, we all know that the workforce issues around behavioral health, uh, psychological well-being, and all of those things uh, suggest that we don't have anywhere near the workforce and didn't before the pandemic, and we certainly don't have them now. Uh, the fact that many uh, providers have gone to telehealth has further reduced access in many cases. While it has broadened the reach, it has uh, in many areas reduced access because there's a limited amount of time available to do virtual uh, visits. And not everyone, believe it or not, in today's technologically savvy world, not everyone either has access to the appropriate technology or is comfortable doing it using technology and, and digital means. So there are lots of issues that the pandemic has raised that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, four in 10 adults have reported some symptom and one in 10 uh, said, uh, compared to one in 10 uh, the year before when this was um, reviewed. Uh, I'm just gonna go through a, a few uh, slides with some charts that um, the Kaiser Family Foundation and their own uh, survey uh, collected data on. If you look at this one in the early days of the pandemic around March, when we really began to recognize it, this is adults who report uh, some worry or stress related to it and, and a negative impact that was having. And in the early days, you know, it was about a third of the population. It went up significantly as we began to hear more and see more of the effects. And we had those great surges in various parts of the country. There was a small dip um, uh, throughout the spring, and then another rise just before um, we really had a handle on just how devastating and deadly this was, how transmissible it was, and the fact that we were still a few months away from having uh, a vaccine. Uh, and people were very worried. We were in big lockdown over the summer and there was the rise in all kinds of other activity, uh, unemployment rise, uh, homelessness rise, and then those um, racial injustice incidents across the country that were driving people to feel very uncertain about their own future and about the future of um, others. Um, this is, these are just slides of, of where adults were in their reporting during this particular survey, uh, age-wise, uh, around anxiety and or depressive disorders. Uh, and as you can see, 
Uh, younger adults tended to trend higher in that level of worry with older adults um, being in the lower percentages for this. Um, those reporting uh, by gender anxiety or depressive disorder during the pandemic. Um, women more than men, not surprising, I'm sure, for many on the uh, call. The, the, the breakdown by race and ethnicity, uh, I think, is interesting because uh, for um, Black and Hispanic, you see that that tends to be higher. Those two groups uh, tend to be um, um, higher than um, all adults that were surveyed in the high 40s versus the mid 40s. Uh, and uh, non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic Asians trending 40 and under. Um, they're the essential and non-essential workers, which was a term that we really didn't hear a lot of before the pandemic. Uh, suddenly people who drove the buses, who uh, did the behind the scenes work in restaurants and uh, other places were essential, but not as well protected as they needed to be. And so a level of stress and anxiety and disorder is present in them uh, that, that we are starting to track better. And we really, just as an aside, we really need to carefully look at how we define essential worker because this is a category of people in the early days of the pandemic who were going out uh, without an understanding of what they were entering. You know, we were in the no mass mass land. We were in people shouldn't be out, but they were out going to work because they were also essential workers. And so we had bus drivers and um, delivery people and others who had to be out without real good information on what they were exposed to exposing themselves to or being exposed to. And for many of these people, they're in the category of folks who tend to be um, in, in need of staying employed because they are the, the primary breadwinner in a family. Uh, many of them, in, a, in, in my part of the country anyway, many of them are part of multi-generational households where many people from different age groups live together. And so you had children, and we, we thought at the time, uh, many people, that children really weren't going to get the virus. And we had, but children were watching the TV, which said that if my mom and dad go out, they could die. We had um, people who were essential workers who were taking care of elderly relatives, sometimes in their homes, sometimes between their home and the relative's home. And they were fr frightened. Um, because we talk about if you think you've been exposed, you have to quarantine. But if you live in a household where there's nowhere to quarantine or there's no way to quarantine, it becomes really a challenge to be protective of your family and loved ones while doing the essential work that brings the money into the home to sustain everyone. So there was a real disconnect uh, there at the beginning that we still have not resolved that we're going to have to do better as we go forward through the rest of this pandemic. Uh, the financial impact on many levels um, bears a closer look um, because the worry and stress related to one's financial status has not been removed as people have either returned to work or gotten different employment or been the beneficiaries of some of the uh, financial supports that government has offered in some of the um, rescue plans. That has not relieved the level of worry and stress about What's next? What's going to happen after this? How am I going to keep things together? And so whether you lost your job or lost your house or had challenges meeting your household expenses, there is a level of worry and stress that continues today and that will continue into the foreseeable future around these things that we have to pay attention to in the behavioral health field. Um, just a few more of these, I think. And um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind down. So what do we do now? Uh, how do we move forward? We understand these, these uh, things that create a problem. We understand the disparities and inequities that existed even before the pandemic that have been magnified um, and accelerated in some cases by the pandemic. And we know that there are cultural barriers and stigma and cultural beliefs that challenge people of color. Uh, about trusting uh, the mental health and behavioral health system. So what do we do? We have this opportunity, unfortunately, thanks to the pandemic, 
to have an open dialogue about change, about what we need to do to improve, what we need to do to elevate these to, to conversations that change policy, that change practice, that change the way we view mental health, mental well-being, psychological distress, however you, you frame contextually the issue that we are talking about, we have an opportunity to do these three things, I think, to, to create a better public understanding of what actually determines health, what creates health within each of us, and how we achieve our maximum, optimum, best state of health and well-being. We can do this with the, with the support of groups like DBSA and its uh, educational and informational outreach. We understand how to help people understand. Uh, and some of the support groups are doing this work, some of the magnificent work that is going on within the infrastructure of DBSA in terms of communicating messages, uh, getting information, good factual uh, information that you can trust about these issues specifically as they relate to people of color, but also in general as it relates to good mental health and well-being for everyone. The second thing we can do is have an agenda, a public agenda around what this needs to translate into. Okay, we've got the science, we've got the facts, we've got the understanding. How do we create a public agenda? We work in organizations like DBSA. We work as a team. We collaborate with other people. We, we put our best uh, information out there and we join forces and create collaborative efforts to shift the paradigm from everyone feeling stigma and discrimination to everyone understanding that A, there is no health without mental health. B, we all deserve the opportunity to have our best health and that we can create structures and strategies that, that throw away and throw out the old paradigm, which is structurally racist and structurally ill-prepared to deal with the needs of various cultural populations. And we can create an agenda and we can have legislators and uh, government uh, agencies and payers and funders and others uh, who, who believe like us that everyone deserves their best mental health uh, or the opportunity to have their best mental health. And then finally, we can acknowledge that we're gonna have to build some political capital to create some political will. We're gonna have to start making some tough choices, holding people accountable for the kinds of policies and programs and practices that are allowed. And that means that we're gonna have to hold people's feet to the fire. If we have a good understanding, we have a great agenda, then we've got to convince the people who make the decisions, whether that's legislators, policymakers, or funders, we have to convince them that they must use their political capital in this way, because we've got the will to hold their feet to the fire. And that's a, you know, I, I say that as if it's an easy thing, but I can tell you after several decades of doing this work, it ain't easy. Uh, but it is necessary. And now we have a window. We have an opening here where everybody's talking about it. People want to see something done about it. Uh, corporations are in this. Uh, legislators, believe it or not, understand it because they're seeing it play out at, at home when they go back and visit. They're seeing it in their own families and their own children. And this is our moment to use that political will to push the needle on better programs better policies, better strategies for making the systems better uh, in ways that, that perhaps we've given up on. And this is where we are. If we center equity, everything else that we do allows us to have a nice cycle that is continuing to grow and expand. Uh, the, this is about power. The people who have the power to make the decisions have got to be helped to understand as they reflect on this, that this is the work we must do.
We got to keep talking and reporting and telling the story of why this is important. And we have to all make the commitment that this is part of our work with the community, not to or for the community. If we can't join forces and partner with the people that we want to help and serve, then we won't achieve the equity that we desire. In order to do this, we've got to have what it says there, an unwavering commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's got to be values-based. And at the center of all of this, at the core of all of this, are the people we want to work with. Uh, our staff have to be trained. Our systems have to be re-engineered. Our communities have to be supported in their learning and understanding of the significance of good mental health to strong, positive, and resilient communities. My, my final takeaway is, let's talk about how we can increase that awareness and acknowledge that racism exists everywhere. It is not confined to the general society. It exists within the behavioral health community, within the behavioral health system. It's, it's a fact. We have to always be willing to take that honest individual and institutional inventory about our system and what we need to do to make it more responsive to the needs of the people we serve. And whenever we are looking at advocacy, we have got to understand that we can't leave out that racial equity perspective. Use that lens to help frame the advocacy uh, work. And finally, my good friend, Dr. Carl Bell, um, who was a psychiatrist uh, in Chicago forever until he passed. Uh, and I, I use him because I know that DBSA is headquartered there. And I know you probably all know of his work. This was the mantra that he left us with before he passed. Risk factors are not predictive factors due to protective factors. The fact that there are risk related to living in a certain zip code, being from a particular racial or ethnic minority group, being part of a vulnerable population, however you define that, that may serve as a risk factor from the standpoint of understanding population health and mental health. It need not be a predictive factor of the outcome and that's the important thing in this particular statement, because there are protective factors. We, all of us gathered here today, are part of the protective factors that can change the trajectory of the lives of the people that we are talking about. And, and if Dr. Bell leaves, left us with nothing else, it was to remember that we are part of the protective factor that can change the, the path, the life path for many of the people who currently don't have the opportunity to have access to good health. Um, my other favorite uh, healthcare hero is Dr. Satcher. And as I said, he, he authored the uh, first Surgeon General's report on mental health and then a subsequent report on race, culture, and ethnicity. Well, he hasn't stopped talking about this stuff. And he acknowledges, as, as this says, that yeah, there's been some improvement, but we still struggle with how can we advance this health equity? How can we quash racist beliefs and biases in the profession? How can we reform racist systems and structures that have created and perpetuate and exacerbate these health inequities that are still experienced by many in society? His words resonate with me on a daily basis as I go about my work of trying to achieve mental health equity in the system where I work. And I hope you will carry these words with you and remember Dr. Satcher and Dr. Bell and I believe this is doable. So I hope um, this has been helpful as part of the leadership summit. It is the process that I use to help me understand how to go about doing my work. And um, I think we've got some time for questions. I hope so anyway, Chrissy. And thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. That was amazing. Um, just a reminder to everybody, if you have any questions, we have five more minutes left. I'm not seeing any questions in there right now, but we'll give it a minute or two to see if anybody has any questions. And if not, we'll just wrap up. Um, in the meantime, um, again, thank you all so much for joining us. And a huge thank you to Dr. Stewart um, for sharing her knowledge and all of her experience and expertise 
expertise with us. We're, we're so lucky to have you. Um, if this is a topic that is important to our attendees, which I'm assuming it is and hoping it is, um, we invite you to join us in the next 15 minutes or so. We have um, our follow-up session, which is about DBSA's priorities and mental health equity, where you can, you can hear from our colleagues, Kimberly King and Kevin Williams, who will share more about DBSA National's work to identify where resource gaps exist in, in DBSA's current um, services and how we can collaborate with organizations that serve systemically underserved communities and what DBSA has been up to thus far to accomplish this. Um, so there are a couple of questions we have just a few minutes to answer, Dr. Stewart. Um, okay, we have Jonathan P asking, how can DBSA assist with local advocacy health equity issues? Well, that's a great question, Jonathan, and one that I love because it means that I get a chance to talk about the kinds of on the ground, boots on the ground stuff that people can do. You know, DBSA is in, in the world of advocacy, it's a big dog. Let's just be clear about that. And anywhere the DBSA goes and carries the message of we can do these things, we must do these things, people listen. And so any DBSA group uh, in, in a local area, uh, an affiliate in a local area can get into the community in the ways that I described. You, you find your, your key stakeholders and trusted and credible messengers. In, in, in black communities, I will tell you honestly, they tend to be in three places. They tend to be in a church that has some standing in the community. They tend to be in local organizations, whether it's the Urban League or the NAACP or the, um, there are a couple of other key black um, uh, social and, and political, well, not political, but, but social and justice is the word I'm looking for, organizations that you will know uh, as, as, as part of that community. And the other place they tend to be is in community organizations. I've never, I've worked in several large cities and I've never been in a place where there wasn't one community organization that stood out above all the others as the go-to place if you wanted to get something done in the black community. Find that place, find those people, uh, introduce yourself to them, uh, explain to them how important mental health is using DBSA facts and, and figures and all of that stuff that we have available for community outreach and engage with them. You don't go in trying to tell them you got to do this. You go in explaining why you believe it's important that in this community, these things start getting looked at. Uh, you know, you can try your local politicians, but depending on where you are in the election season, you may or may not get an audience. And, and what you really want is to have people who will go there with you who are known to that elected official. You don't want to make a cold call at when, the, when the senator or the congressman is, is in the home office. You want to build a little support and collaboration and convene some meetings and talk about mental health and bring in some people that look like that community from that community who are the mental health people. If you're in Chicago, find the black psychiatrists and the black social workers and psychologists, engage them in helping to craft that credible message that you wanna take into the community. Host a meeting saying, we wanna know what your concerns are about mental health. I mean, there, as you can see, I, I spend a lot of time doing this stuff. So I've got 101 uh, ways to engage a community around mental health, a black community around mental health. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we had a couple of other questions that are similarly people looking to get involved. So I would just say to anybody who had more questions about that, please feel free to reach out to your contacts at DBSA and we will get you the right information. And thank you again so much, Dr. Stewart. We're so thankful to have you here. And thank you all for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your time with the DBSA Leadership Summit. Thank you.